This episode is also made possible by our Patreon supporters, Noli B, Julie Gray, Mary Jones, Jessica Smith, Kim Hokinson, Jan Elise Cannon, Jill Harrigan, Jamie Lang, Maria Carla Sanchez, Heather McKinnon, Valerie Jacobson, Chantel Oliver, Eric and Carolyn Shumway, Katrina and Kristen, Tamzane Weir, Caitlin McTaggart, and Lindsay Cummings. And a very happy birthday to Rachel Fisher. Hi, Katie. Hi, Olivia. This episode is going to be a little bit different huh. than our usual one. Because in this episode, my guests are the writer, producer, and the director for an upcoming episode of the PBS documentary series The American Experience. Which, oh. oh! Which airs oh. next oh. week. I happen to and know one of the scholarly guests on that episode is one Olivia Mickle. Hey, yeah. <laughs> so cool. So this is a bit of flipping the script. Mm-hmm. I was their guest expert, and now <laughs> they're my guest expert. Cool. And have you basically lived your dream? Like, yeah, it's still. Was it on your bucket list to be a talking head on PBS? It was so far off my bucket list as inconceivable and would never ever yeah. happen. The whole thing was very surreal. This is not uh-huh. happening. I'm not really here. But it turns out I was, and it did. So, cool. <laughs> Airing April 4th. Live TV. That's charming and quaint. I know. We had to go set up an antenna so that I can watch myself wow. on TV. Wow. But can't you just... It is also available streaming. Right. There's like a if... PBS app, right? Yes. Cool. They've done an incredible job. I cannot wait for our listeners to see it. And I literally could not wait to share her story. <laughs> so I've decided to jump the gun just a little bit and give everyone a sneak preview of their own with this episode on the astonishing woman who is the focus of that documentary, Maria Telkish. Never heard of her. She's amazing, incredible, fascinating, compelling, mysterious, brilliant, unstoppable. <laughs> And was very appropriately known in her lifetime as the Sun Queen. The Sun Queen. Up there with best nicknames ever. Yeah. I want to be the Sun Queen. I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating Women You've Never Heard Of. So, for this episode, I spoke with Amanda Pollack and Jean Tempest. I'm Amanda Pollock, and I directed Sun Queen, and I had never heard of Maria Talkish before I started working on this story. So it was a huge learning curve and full of surprises. And my name is Jean Tempest, writer and producer on this film about this amazing solar scientist. I was lucky enough to see a sneak preview of this film. It is genuinely amazing. I mean, as a PBS kid who became a family PBS adult (laughs) and who used to watch the American experience with our grandpa, they have excelled even their own standards. That's awesome. Maria Telkis was born in Budapest, Austria-Hungary, now just Hungary, in 1900. Oh my. That's going to be messy. Yeah, it's it's an exciting time to be living in <laughs> Austria-Hungary. <laughs> we don't know very much about her childhood at all. But we know she was extremely brilliant, extremely determined, and extremely focused on learning and specifically science. And huh. we can be sure of that because when she finished school, she attended the University of Budapest where she got a degree in physical chemistry. Wow! Hungary, as a woman, in 1920. Cool. She went on to get a PhD four years later. In Budapest? In Budapest. That's amazing. The Ottoman Empire is being dismantled yeah, it, while she is studying at university. Yeah, amazing. So when she graduates, she begins teaching at the university 
which is also astonishing, but it was a chance vacation that she took in 1925 that will change her life forever. She comes to Cleveland. What? To visit a relative who was at that time serving as the Hungarian consul, and she fell in love with the U.S. Wow. In Cleveland, Ohio. Ohio. (laughs) Lovely. No hate to Cleveland. No, not at all. I've heard it rocks. Ha! It's just unusual. She completely fell in love, especially apparently with the science, the innovation, everything that she felt she wanted to be part of. The cutting edge science and the things she's interested in is happening here. Yeah. So... Shortly after that, she was accepted into a position as a biophysicist for the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Oh, well now. I didn't think about Cleveland Clinic. Of course, if she went to Cleveland Clinic, it's like the leading medical innovator in, like, the world. Yeah, good point. At the Cleveland Clinic, she worked with a surgeon named George Washington Cryle, now known as the first person to successfully conduct a direct blood transfusion. And together, they created a photoelectric device to record brain waves. Whoa. Like an EEG. Wow. In 1929, she helped invent the EEG. Wow. Mind-blowing. Wow. Telkish became an American citizen in 1937. And then moved to Westinghouse Electric. So she's moved from the best medical research to the pioneering corporate research, electrical Device research, maker. Okay. Yes. Uh-huh. where she was hired as a research engineer. And there she developed some of the first instruments that could convert heat into electrical energy. Oh. Two years later, she will begin her first work in earnest on solar technology. Wow, in the 30s. In the 30s. And this is one of the things about her story that I love, that it gives me a chance to lecture everyone about (laughs) solar in the 1930s. That was the other thing that was really revelatory about this story, is how much this question of solar was really, like, at top of mind throughout history, like, really going back to the 1880s, and certainly during her lifetime, So that was really amazing to see and to be able to find that in the archival material in the newspapers and in the photographs of solar water heaters on houses in the early 20s and things like that. And just how much press coverage she was getting in the early days for the work that she was doing. This was something people were really thinking about and talking about. We act like solar is new. We act like solar technology arrived in the 70s. That is nonsense. Solar was everything. Mm. Everyone was super into solar. It was on every magazine. It was on every Mm. radio show. Solar is the bright, shining hope. (laughs) Everyone believed this is just around the corner. She more than anyone, and she is going to do everything she can to make it happen. Now, while she is at Westinghouse in 1939, she was hired to work on part of the solar energy conversion project with MIT to develop a device similar to the ones she had invented the previous year. Those ones created electricity from heat. These ones will create electricity from sunlight. This is incredibly promising research. If anyone can do it, she can do it. But, oh, oh, what year is it again? Oh, right. (laughs) 1939. World Uh War II is about to interrupt her work. You'd think the military would kind of support it. You'd think during a war they'd be like, solar energy could be very helpful. And in a way, they do. But there were more important priorities up front. Telkish is assigned to the U.S. Office of Scientific Research and Development, which is working with the military. Oh, I was kind of joking that the military hired her, but they did. 
They did. Oh. <laughs> For them, she will create one of still her most important and most impactful inventions, a portable solar distiller that turns seawater into drinkable water. Whoa. Powered only by the sun. Dang. Small enough to put on every lifeboat and capable of producing enough fresh water every day to sustain several people. That's amazing. It's incredible. It is literally life-saving technology. Naval battles in the Pacific Ocean at this point often leave soldiers ah. stranded at sea for yes. days. This system is cheap enough to mass produce, put on every ship, every lifeboat. This can save thousands of lives. Huh. It takes zero knowledge to operate. You put it down. You put water in it, and it works. It evaporates wow. the seawater and creates fresh water. As granddaughters of a uh, <laughs> Navy officer who, who was some floated at sea yes. at Okinawa. Yeah. Maybe he used this. Oh, wait. No, yeah. he didn't. Because no. while she invented it in 1942, well, let's take a step back here. Because we need to meet one of our main antagonists. Uh-oh. The Navy was delighted with this invention. They ordered production for every ship. As they should. Then Hoyt Hoddle steps in. Hoyt. What a name, right? Hoyt Hoddle. Yeah. Hoddle? Hoddle. H-O-T-T-E-L. Hoyt Hoddle. Wow. Great villain name. He is running the project for MIT. Okay. Maria Tokish and Hoyt Hoddle have very different philosophical approaches to science, let's say. Maria Tokish is all about speed, efficiency, get it out there fast. Save people. People's <laughs> lives are on the line. Let's get it done. They're both trying to accomplish the same goal, but Hoddle is really obsessed with the process and doing everything completely by the book and the manufacturing. And Telkish just wants to get it out there. Oh, we're halfway through production, but we could save a few dollars by shifting to this manufacturer? Let's do that. Mm. He is delaying and delaying and delaying, changes manufacturers three times midstream. She is furious and helpless. She knows that every single day they delay is costing real lives. Wait, come on. We're going to keep repeating that phrase, I'm guessing, throughout <laughs> this episode. <laughs> In fact, Hoyt Huddle dithered around so long that her invention, which again she prototyped in 1942, was never used by any sailor in World War II. The war was over before a single solar still was delivered no. to the Navy. It's bureaucracy, but he just didn't want a girl in the playground. Oh boy, I tell you. You don't know anything about that. Oh yeah, patriarchal bureaucracy? Hmm. I haven't seen people derail entire projects with grant potential. Hey, speaking of which. Uh-oh. She was livid over needless loss of life for what she saw as nitpicking, cheap nonsense. And this first collaboration between these two will set the stage for what will become a recurring theme in Telkish's work for the next decade, at least. Ugh. After the war, Telkish moves to MIT full-time. She is hired to the new, innovative, exciting Solar Fund project. So this is a brand new solar research project within the engineering department at MIT, explicitly tasked with innovating solar technology. Hoddle is made the head of that project. Boo. And he is not alone. The men of the department and especially the solar project to which she has been assigned, were, let's just be honest, furious that a girl had been allowed in the treehouse. <laughs> you know how sometimes, going back, we have to sort of 
infer the sexism from very carefully coded references, read between the lines of what's going mm. on, and, and it takes a lot of detective work and careful close reading. That is very much not the case here. <laughs> uh, these men were very comfortable saying the quiet part out loud pretty <laughs> often and pretty emphatically. Ugh. Their letters to each other and to the administrators at MIT are quite an eye-opening and often eye-watering read. Telkish is, for example, a person of strong opinions, which she expresses forcibly. <laughs> and, as one of them insists, even people outside the Solar Fund find it impossible to agree with her for any length of time. <laughs> and yet, also in those same letters, complaining that she has a wide circle of influential acquaintances who are impressed with her enthusiasm for solar heating and her apparent intelligence. <gasps> what? The argument being made is nobody likes her. Uh-huh. But also, everyone likes her. And that's <laughs> not okay. And being popular is a bad look for a scientist. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. She's in the ultimate double bind. She's too prickly and too social. She's too likable and charming and too difficult to get along with. She is too well-connected and too foreign and disconnected. Yeah. Anything they can wow. throw at her, they're going to throw at her. Yeah. And she keeps it being popular and getting attention. Mm -hmm. They hated her charm. They hated what they saw as her grubbing for money in inappropriate <laughs> ways because yeah. obviously academic fundraising should be done in the dark back rooms of posh men's only clubs of over course. port and cigars as God intended, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Even though this money that she is getting is quite literally paying their salaries. That's academia. That's it right there. She's more popular than me. Yes. And she is making science accessible. How dare she? She talks to the press. She explains things <gasps> in regular people language. She is charming and fun. Oh my gosh. And is on the news a lot. And that makes us really angry because, yeah. subtext, nobody puts us on the news. Yeah. Now, the attention that she's getting from the press is not particularly uh, appropriate, let's oh. say. Lots and lots of... Are they like, a she scientist? Yes, a blonde oh. female scientist or a oh, glamorous my. blonde yeah. scientist, exotic Hungarian scientist. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not paying attention to her because of her brain. Mm-hmm. She knows that this is getting her attention, and so she uses it. Fine, if they want to talk to the glamorous blonde Hungarian scientist, that's an opportunity for me to talk about solar. I will accept the reason they're doing it and use it to my advantage. They hate that she is rapidly becoming the face of MIT engineering. She makes science seem like something that anyone can be interested in. Wow. Some things never change. Yes. I mean, you and I have a lot of experience with the segment of academia that sneers at accessibility or mm -hmm. using, using words, regular words that people <laughs> can understand. Mm -hmm. That's happening. And misogyny. And xenophobia. And plain old jealousy. Jealousy. Turf wars. And just really, really open dismissal of any woman who has the audacity to be pretty and try to do science. That's actually something that we also thought a lot about in terms of how to make the film, because I think certainly... The sexism was a huge part of the story and definitely enraging when you see how she was held back and it makes you wonder what could have been. 
But at the same time, she also was pretty formidable and went out and pushed ahead even with those blocks. And we really didn't want her story to just be about this woman who's being held back by men or that that sexism was really the primary story here. That was a balancing act, certainly, in like how to tell her story. Yeah, and I think we're trying to find this full and real person who did actually exist and who did actually do this science. And obviously the assertiveness that a woman would need to earn a doctorate in engineering in Hungary in the 1920s and then emigrate to the U.S. and get a job at MIT <laughs> Yeah, in this especially post-World War II retrenchment to neo-Victorian gender role policing. Mm -hmm. Of course, any woman who can do that is going to be wrong when she's doing it. It is true that she was apparently a very big personality, and she is often a little exhausting to be around. <laughs> I think part of the side that was maybe not most appealing to me, I was really interested in, was how difficult she is too, and like how hard she is to work with, and all these other sides of being an incredibly committed, very brilliant person. I think once we started to grapple with those, like it's not a modern story, although there's fantastic echoes, it's good to remember that this is happening at a different time. And yet, it's so easy to see this very brilliant woman who's a groundbreaker in every way, not just the science, but also where she is and what she's doing. And then at the same time, like, of course she's too much. She's way too much. She's way too committed. She's funny, but, and that's one of my favorite quotes that uh, we have it in the film. It's by her collaborator, the architect. She's an amusing woman, but in small doses, like, you can't go full Telkish all the time. But she never gives up. And I think we often say that in film, and it's such a sort of Hollywood type lingo. But like, she was a deeply committed person, for better or for worse, kind of all the time. But the poorly controlled disdain sneering for her brain her worth, her opinions, not just what she's doing, but her right to be in the room from these men is pretty hard to read now. I get pretty viscerally angry reading base. Mm. More confusingly, Hoyt Hoddle is also just not a fan of solar research in general. He is the head of the solar fund at MIT, the arguably most prestigious solar program in the world, and he is openly saying he thinks solar won't work. <laughs> he's not just skeptical, he's actively mocking the very idea of solar. How fascinating. Weirdly rude and dismissive. In 1940, in a lecture, as the head of MIT Solar, he was mocking the people who talk about we have limitless energy from the sun. Remarks like these have attracted uncounted crank inventors who've approached the problem with little more mental equipment than a rosy optimism. I see. Very pointedly aimed at donors who are funding his job. Weird. Telkish responds by comparing conservative engineers who deride the power of solar and the possibility of using it to people who preferred horses to automobiles. <laughs> exactly. Sunlight will be used as a source of energy sooner or later. Why wait? Ah. Big oil bribed him. Maybe? Yeah, 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 yeah. Big oil or coal. That's my opinion now. He just seems like one of those dudes that well, another solar engineer described Hoyt Huddle as a man who bought a ticket on a horse and threw it away before the race was over and now can't bear to think that his horse might come in. 
Oh, wow. That's brilliant. He, once he's said it's not going to work, mm. he needs to make sure it's not going to work. Yeah. He builds his whole academic career on being the reasoned skeptic. Mm. He's one of those people who seems to have believed that optimism is stupidity. Mm-hmm. And in Enthusiasm is embarrassing. Yeah. Being cool and cynical yeah. is if you're too good the way for to go. Anything, it just makes you better than everybody else. Yeah. It's weird, weird, weird. So with this lethal combination of sexism and xenophobia and Huddle's weird fetish for contrarianism about his own field, over and over again, she is sidelined or sabotaged. And this made her perhaps a bit paranoid, but perhaps mostly just right in how she perceived Hoddle's interactions with her especially and the department in general. The biggest fight between the two comes over the use of something called Glauber's salts. MIT at this point is building a test solar house. It is not a house, it's a shed on the MIT campus, but it's the first test. Huh. Now this project is totally different from solar power as we think of, or as she had been working on early on, this is not converting heat to electricity. It is just storing heat and then redeploying it. She has developed a really innovative new system for passive solar heating using Glauber's salts. Are you saying salts? Salts, mineral salts. Okay. Now these are phase change materials, which is a fancy way of saying changes its form when it changes temperature, goes from solid to liquid or liquid to solid, like, for example, water. Water. Okay. Phase change materials are better at absorbing heat and then releasing heat. Glauber salts are especially good. They're solid. When they get very hot, they turn liquid. And then as they cool, they go solid again, releasing all of that stored heat. So, Telkish wanted to see if they could use this to heat a house. In MIT-1, this glorified shed, they use barrels of Glauber's salts hidden within all the walls. They absorb the heat all day and then release it at night. That sounds like the heating system in my 200-year-old flat in England. Bricks that get heated during a certain time of day and then the bricks just release heat for the rest of the day. Yeah, we've been doing that as humanity Yeah, forever. for hundreds of yeah. years. She recognizes that and said, what if we did that only much, much better? Yeah. Right. Now that experiment failed. As did my heater in English. It was <laughs> crappy. <laughs> the salts leaked. They corroded the barrels. They didn't work the way they were supposed to. Huddle blamed Telkish. Telkish blamed Hoddle for not following her instructions and not supervising the grad students closely enough during installation. She had very strict instructions on what had to happen as you install these. You have to keep a certain temperature all the time. You have to do very specific protocols to keep the salt stable until the house is done. He had not done that, and she thought that's why it had failed. She wants to try again. Hoddle absolutely refuses. Uh huh. Finally, she takes it to the MIT president, Carl Compton, who thankfully listens to her and urges Hoddle to listen and to try it again. Hmm. She doesn't like seeing her ideas brushed aside like this, he wrote. And in my opinion, we should make a bold approach, make a, a real house and try it for real, following her instructions. Rather than, in his words, puttering around with further measurements. Uh (laughs) It seems pretty clear that it is not just Telkish who is annoyed by Hoddle's Puttering around. Yes. Surely things are about to go Telkish's way. Yeah. Never underestimate the stubbornness of a man whose ego has been ruffled. (sighs) Hoddle not only rejects the idea of using Glauber salts again, He dismisses Telkish from the solar energy project entirely. No. He reassigns her to MIT's metallurgy department, (laughs) which is a clear demotion knockdown. 
She resumes her research on thermocouples, transferring solar energy to electricity, but she is not involved in any of these projects. She is firmly put on a shelf in the back room, told to keep quiet and play with her nice toys and stop bothering the grown-ups. Yeah, yep, yep. Hoddle pretty much disowns the solar project. It sits there, doing nothing. What? Oh. Leaving millions in funding just lying on the table. And these men in this department with Hoddle at the front blow up their own program rather than allow Maria Telkish to succeed. Mm-hmm. But of course, we have hopefully learned by now that Maria Telkish will not be stopped. And That's so amazing. by 1948... I would quit. Yeah, I, you did, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I know what would happen if I were in that scenario. Yeah, yeah. what would you do if you were in that scenario? I would walk away. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> she does not. Well, she kind of does. She is sidelined to metallurgy. Mm-hmm. She's not allowed in the club. So is she just going to make metallurgy freaking awesome then? Oh, she did that, too. Okay. But she says, fine, I will build my own treehouse. Ah. And by 1948, she has teamed up with the architect Eleanor Raymond, who is an absolutely brilliant woman architect. Oh, boy. Also from Boston. She is now credited, was not at the time, as being the first to innovate American regional modernism, a very important architectural trend that she was doing we have now discovered five years before the man who has been getting credit mm -hmm. for doing that. Mm -hmm. She's innovative. She's controversial. She's mostly building houses for other powerful women. Cool. Because they're the only ones who will hire her. Facing similar problems. She is visionary. She is committed. She is unsweet and iced out of the boys club. She was described by one of her clients as an architect who combines a respect for tradition with a disrespect for its limitations. Ooh, which I love. Wow. That's nice. These two team up, and they have an absolutely audacious, ambitious plan. They want to build the first real passive solar heated house with Glauber's salts. They just need money. Mm -hmm. In comes Amelia Peabody. What? Not that Amelia Peabody. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite fictional characters is named Amelia Peabody. Yeah, yeah. This is not Amelia Peabody. Victorian feminist archaeologist. This is Amelia Peabody. Peabody. Uh -huh. As in Peabody, Massachusetts. As in Peabody, Massachusetts. As in money, Peabody, philanthropy, Essex, yeah, okay. art. Yay. But she is almost as awesome, I must say. She is an American millionaire, philanthropist, livestock breeder, and sculptor. Okay. Quite, quite a list. Mm -hmm. And she sought out opportunities to collaborate with and support other women in the arts, sciences, mm. anyone in the men's playground Thank who's being goodness. sidelined. They approach her, and she gets super excited about this project and declares, yes, absolutely, I'm in. She funds the whole thing and gives them land to build it on. Cool. On one of her farms in Dover, Massachusetts. I think one of my favorite parts of her whole story is the moment where she really finds Amelia Peabody and Eleanor Raymond to collaborate with. And you realize that, yes, Maria Telkish was exceptional, but there were women like her in all different levels and all different fields. And the way that they find each other and that they come together and do this really creative, bold, exciting thing is something that wouldn't have easily happened within the institution of MIT, even under the best of circumstances. The kind of creativity that can flourish when you let these three loose is pretty amazing. Two things that really strike me about it are, first of all, that it isn't that exceptional, that there are these women everywhere who are breaking out and doing interesting things and trying to push the boundaries and that they have this incredible collaboration. Yeah, it was such an exciting part of the story in the way that everybody's excited. It's a three-person collaboration in which they're really all in it together. Now, if I was gonna build a solar house, 
I'm not sure Massachusetts would be my first choice. <laughs> Famously, lots hey, of sun, yeah. never cold. There's there's a good month of sun in July. <laughs> and that, that was actually the point. They wanted to prove it could work even in extremely cold cool. places. The Dover Sun House is fascinating. It's completely new in every way. Wildly innovative architecture, wildly innovative science, and they're going to move in a family with a young child to live there and to run it. They will cool. be the scientists monitoring conditions. It's like making sure everything is working right. Is, was the design futuristic too? Was it like, this is the Jetsons house kind of thing? Yes, and it's it's described at one point in the media as being an oversized chicken coop. Interesting. <laughs> it is a one wall of windows, a slanted one-way roof. Okay. A long rectangle okay. with a slanted roof yeah. and one wall of windows. It's a chicken coop. Okay. It's very cool looking, very not a house, but it does fit in nicely with the advent of mid-century modern mm -hmm. aesthetic. Like anti-Victorian. Oh, That's... it is the most modern looking mm. chicken coop you've ever seen in your life. Okay. It's a chicken coop in the year 2050. Okay. <laughs> as imagined in 1948. <laughs> and on Christmas Eve, the family moves in. Middle of winter, cool. And initially the press had suggested that she was going to live it in herself. Andrew Nimothy, who was a little boy who grew up in the house, it was his view. She didn't really want to be that far from Boston. Dover's a little bit of a trek, and she had her life in Boston and then her lab at MIT. And after having been enrolled at MIT, and she has these complaints about the graduate students, they're doing things wrong. I did wonder if having family at Dover was a way of keeping a little bit more control. This is actually a distant cousin of Maria Telkish's Hungarian refugees who oh, have cool. arrived in the U.S. So wow, they are going to live in the house, be her eyes on the ground, and they are going to function as ambassadors and literal tour guides. Cool. Good because idea. this house is very popular. It makes a huge splash in the media. Yeah. And Maria Telkish's number one goal, make sure that the public knows what's mm. going on. So the house is open for tours two days a week. Cool. And the family are the tour guides. You can visit the Dover Sun House. You just roll up at the front door and they will give you a tour of every nook and cranny of the house. Explain the Glauber salts, show you how everything works. And that little boy, actually, is featured in the documentary. Oh, you mean like they interviewed him now? Yeah. Talking uh. about growing up in this house. Cool. Absolutely fascinating. The press absolutely loved this. They ate it up. It's an all-woman team. The unconventional, modern, house of the future appearance. Mm. The citizen scientists inside. Plus her accent yeah. and her appearance and her passion. This was front page news. Well, what happened? It worked? I mean... It worked. It proved it worked. It was a victory. Take that, Hoyt. Until it wasn't. Uh. <laughs> it worked spectacularly well for a while. Mm. It exceeded her ambitions. The house was at a steady 72 degrees... All winter. Wow. With only passive solar heating. I mean, my house in Massachusetts was never yeah, 72 was degrees never 72 in the winter. Degrees. Never. <laughs> and then some problems. The Glauber salts start stratifying as they had in the first MIT shed. The tanks are cracking and corroding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's starting to get colder. Uh oh. Eventually, frantic phone calls. Oh, shoot. From Dover to Maria, begging for supplementary heat solutions. Ugh. And so, for a while, as they're trying to figure out what's going on, the family is 
hiding electric space heaters in the closets as oh the people gosh. come through to ah. tour the house. <laughs> Eventually, Oops. they realize it's just not going to work. Much as we hate to admit it, mm-hmm. White Huddle was right. Ugh. The Glauber mm. salts really don't work. They are not a practical solution. Shoot. They work spectacularly well for a couple of years. Eleanor Raymond and Amelia Peabody are pretty devastated by this. Yeah. This is a total failure. Eventually, all of the solar elements are removed and a gas furnace wow. is put in the house. Shoot. They're devastated. They had been so hopeful and so determined, and it didn't work. Mm. There's a lot of heartbreak when the Dover Sun House actually ends up failing. And in many ways, Maria Tulkish is the most resilient one. She's on to the next project in solar, and her two collaborators mourn pretty heavily. Amelia Peabody ends up keeping these big canisters of Glauber salts, basically ugly industrial canisters as a keepsake. And Raymond writes pretty beautifully about, about this being a devastating blow, that, that we're going to have to shutter this experiment. And uh, Telkish does recognize that, but at the same time, she's on t- to the next thing. They were all rowing in the same direction for Dover. They all continued to do cool work. But I was surprised by, it seems like the emotional blip was a little bit more shallow with our scientists than the other two. This is her life work. This is her fight for Glauber salts. And she doesn't seem very upset that it didn't work. Hmm. But really, I mean, that this is science. Yeah. This is the point of science. Yeah. Which just failure thinking, is not failure. It's a big step. Yeah. She just yeah. discovered that... That, doesn't that it work. doesn't work. Yeah, right. That's big. And, <laughs> and that's part of the process. That's expected. Yeah. Failure is as valuable as any other data because now you know what not to do. Mm-hmm. That is not the way we generally tend to look at architecture or uh, yeah. sculpture or mm, good philanthropy. Point. And as hard as the men at MIT and men around her in general tried really, really hard to cast these kind of normal, all-in-a-day science failures as failures. Mm. She always understood her failures in context. She was not slowed down by them at all. Wow. She took notes and moved on. Cool. The question of failure, I think, is so interesting to think about because when you have a woman in science, it starts just raising these questions of who's allowed to fail, really? Who's given the latitude and who's not given the latitude? And it's a subtle thing from the outside, or it's easy to say, her house failed. That's why nobody knows her name. Just talk to Thomas Edison about failure. (laughs) Or Tesla's pigeons. We don't even want to know what they have to say, actually. (laughs) MIT is furious. She is making them look bad by doing this project off campus mm. when they have tried to sideline her. But side it failed, her. so aren't they happy? Again, double bind. She is making them look bad by doing successful projects with other people. And then she is making them look bad by failing while being a member of MIT. She is relentless. She's ambitious. She is also, if we're honest, a bit too impatient. She does push too hard, too quickly on things sometimes. In a way with the Dover House, she rushes into that. She's done sort of a scientific experiment at MIT that's had a lot of problems. And many people would say, let's do this a few more times. Let's work out the kinks. Instead, she says, no, let's move full throttle ahead and let's move a family in there with a little kid to live in this house and test it out. She was impatient. That is such like a core part of who she was and was certainly her great strength, but also probably a little bit of her Achilles heel because she really believed that this had to be done because it was for the best interest of humanity and she wasn't going to wait around. Given what happened with Huddle and the solar still during World War II, one can hardly blame her for that. Yeah. 
she knows she has to push relentlessly to get anything to move, right? So maybe she is pushing too fast sometimes. This one, it's Hoddle's fault, in my opinion. If he would have done it correctly the first time, if he would have had respect for her process in installing the Glauber oh. salts in the first MIT house, she would have learned, okay, that doesn't work Ah, yeah. the first time. Mm. But because she couldn't trust that he had done it correctly, she had to do it again. Mm. I think it's their ego, too. Like, I think that's right. And, and that's part of her sales. But let's give her ego as well. She also thinks she's right. Mm -hmm. I think she wants to prove the dude's wrong. There's got to be an element, ahistorical or not, where, like, she's smart. She's a genius. She cares about this stuff a lot. Yes, she wants to solve humanity's problems. But let's give her an ego, too. Let's let her be free. A hundred percent. I'm sure that was a part of it, too. Like, this is not a self-effacing woman. There's something else going on there at the same time. I think it can be both. I think she is truly one of those truly single-minded, passionate, this is my life's mission kind of people who are physically incapable of not pursuing the thing full throttle all day, every day. Yeah. And those people change the world, even if they are sometimes a bit exhausting to hang out with. <laughs> In 1953, after an investigation, in quotes, No. Uh, she is fired. Wow. I guess that shouldn't surprise me. And commissioned by the Ford Foundation to develop a simple-to-make, simple-to-operate solar oven. Oh. I think this is up there in the other most important things she may have invented. She presents to the press with great fanfare, an incredibly cheap, incredibly simple, incredibly safe solar oven that can cook at temperatures of up to 350 degrees with just the sun. Wow. This oven will not just make cooking easier, it will save lives. Because if you're in a refugee camp and you have to leave the camp to get firewood, you are putting yourself at risk. If you are a young girl who has to venture further and further and further into the forest every day to find firewood, you're putting yourself at risk and you can't go to school. Yeah. If we can just use the sun to cook our food, girls go to school, people stay alive, air stays cleaner, forests yeah. stay forested. It is a huge Amazing. impact. Yeah. Still huge today. Still today. This is still basically exactly the same model. Millions of people in refugee camps every day. Wow. Today. And that's the first thing she does when she is kicked out of the sexy, manly science of MIT Solar. Mm. Is to say, I like that. fine, I'll change the world. Yeah. She gets kicked out. I she will goes, make things right. better. For women and girls especially, right? Aww. This is largely going to impact women and girls. That's awesome. This is really, I think, the core of Maria Telkish for me. Everything she accomplished is amazing. She would be one of my heroes no matter what. But for me, this is what makes Maria Telkish incredible. There are lots of people who make great scientific advancements and love pursuing new knowledge and that's amazing and I very much honor that and I am a person who is firmly on team education for the sake of education but for Maria Telkish at the bottom of all of it all the time is people she is never just pursuing the science for the science it is always about reducing human suffering hmm. people are the point how can this thing Help. Make the world better yeah. for people. Mm. That is Maria Telkish. Her total commitment to people, to making human life better. Everything else is incredible. That is mm. what I love. That's why I want her on a t-shirt. That's <laughs> why she is one of my heroes. That commitment to humanity as the point of science. Yeah is something that is very often missing. 
If there's a Maria Telkish, it's like she was a brand. Her t-shirt definitely says practical solutions for everyday problems. That's what Maria Telkish was about, and she wanted to use the sun to, to figure those things out. She eventually finds a home at the University of Delaware, where she expands her research, turning solar into electricity. There you go. Instead of just heat. And in 1971, she and her colleagues built Solar One, which is the first house to ever generate both heat and electricity from the sun. That's awesome. And this kicks off the nationwide solar boom that made us all think that solar was invented in the 70s. Um, her house. Her house is the first one ah. that says, look, we can do this. So she just, I mean, it was her persistence for 20 years that oh. finally got the house that worked. 60 years. Ah. She is dedicated to this heart and soul for the rest of her life. And, and maybe even, apparently, literally. We got pretty close to her, but we never found her, I don't think. I don't think we can say we found Maria Telkish. And one of the things that struck me is we never found relationships. She wasn't friendless. This isn't a story of a woman who wasn't popular. She's very popular and she has this huge Hungarian diaspora that she's plugged into here in the States. There's not a huge family story. There's not a bunch of partners. It's interesting. But she seems to walk that line where it's not just the scientist. But there's also not that much beyond the science that we were able to see. And I'm not sure if it was there or not. I don't know what your sense, Amanda, is. like. Yeah, it's an interesting point for sure. She seems like somebody who was truly obsessive and passionate about what she wanted to do. And my impression is that she just threw everything she had into this question of how to harness the power of the sun. But there are people like that. I know Absolutely. people like that now who their life revolves around a single question or passion that they just feel like it's their raison d'etre. I think she was one of those, but it's hard to know. This is not the story of a person who I think was crushed by her circumstances. I don't know, but I don't think so. What is Claire? She truly, truly, truly loved her work. She never stopped. She dies at age 94 and she's still working on solar. So she is, she is truly just, it's what she wants to do. It's also part of this paradox, right, that so many women are prevented from working in these fields means that the few who make it through find each other mm -hmm. and find ways to work outside of the lines together. And it's interesting to think what would happen now, right, if Maria Telkush is born in the 21st century, if she was working now. What would be different? What would be the same? Many of these issues are still very much issues. Women being locked out of STEM is very much still an issue. It has gotten better, but the lady scientist angle is no longer there. Mm. You won't get the press attention. It's such a tricky question, because for me, Marie Tokish is like part science, but she's also part promotion. And when we look at her life and into the press of the 50s and the 40s. What's curious about how high she was able to fly, and I think it was part of her skill and part of her genius, was that she was able to use the fact that she was a woman. You see these headlines, petticoat Prometheus, and like girl scientist, etc. For as horrible as it was, and there's no question that it was horrible, and there's no question that it set both her science back and science writ large back. Uh, if she'd been born today, that whole side of the promotion and that whole sort of charisma angle and the role that she gets to play in selling solar to America drops out potentially. It's fascinating to think about how she would have been operating now. Yeah. I bet she could just turn her science into some really great TikTok dances. Yes. That's exactly like, what I said. You work with what the culture is serving. 
she was always ready to embrace any avenue that might help her solve problems. Mm -hmm. Because in, in many ways, it's the same thing, right? She was bypassing the gatekeepers at that point by using their own biases against them here. Yeah. She's just bypassing the gatekeepers. Yeah. And embracing what makes her different. And yeah. people respond to that. Talkish on TikTok, would she be? How would she be? Uh, that's, a good, that's a good image. I think, yeah. You'd find a way. <laughs> yeah, totally. She was at the right place at the wrong time in so many ways, but she was also a creature of her time, and she used her own kind of crappy time to her advantage pretty effectively, actually, and I think we should give her credit for that, too. She thrived as much as she could in this environment that was stacked against her, and it's a real skill, and I think a pretty unique one that I'm not sure would translate as well to today. I hope it wouldn't. I think we've moved a little bit the ball, but maybe not. This is just a taste of the delights that await you in The Sun Queen <laughs> on The American Experience on PBS, April 4th. It is an absolutely incredible film and makes me as a Telkish fangirl extremely happy. So I highly recommend everyone tunes into that. Let's shout from the rooftops because yeah. she perfectly embodies to me what science should be and so often is not. Huge thanks to our guests, Amanda Pollack and Jean Tempest. Be sure to check out the American Experience episode, The Sun Queen, airing April 4th, 2013, on PBS in the U.S., or find it online at the American Experience or on your PBS app. Our interns are Kira Maxwell and Katie Boucher. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd be so grateful if you'd leave us a review on any podcast platform. It makes a huge difference in helping new listeners find us. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of photos each week. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickle and Katie Nelson, and this episode was edited by Olivia Mickle.